Uh, well, welcome. Uh, this is a series of sustainable wood stories um, put on by our company, Sustainable Northwest Wood. My name is Lynn Morgan. I'm the marketing manager for Sustainable Northwest Wood. I'm joined by my colleague, Terry Campbell, who's going to monitor um, the chat and will help kind of keep us on track as far as timing goes. Uh, we have a, a really great program today, and I'm excited to share some amazing organizations that are doing really good work in the world, in our community, and it's all focused around gardening. And, um, and then what you can do with this incredible lumber that we have at our shop, uh, Western Juniper. And I'm going to talk just a, just a touch about our company in, in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, Sustainable Northwest Wood is local wood for the greater good. And uh, we are really focused and believe in helping people build with purpose. Uh, we know that when we combine forces that we can really have a positive impact for our environment and for our community. And, and we love being able to do that together. And uh, we are a small team uh, with a local lumber and wood products shop and store and lumber yard in Southeast Portland. Would love to have you come down and see what we have to offer and talk to some of our wood enthusiasts on our team and, um, and figure out ways that you can also build with purpose. We um, partner with local sawmills here in our area and fabricators who help us source and create an array of wood products. Um, and we cover everything from juniper, which we'll talk about today, um, and any kind of building material that you need that's made out of wood grown here in the Pacific Northwest and um, exclusively sourced from responsibly managed forest and restoration projects throughout our region. And in doing that, it helps provide jobs for a whole network of people in our community and, and beautiful lumber products for you. Our, our wood products tell stories about local places and people. And what we're gonna focus on today is Restoration Juniper. This is a lumber that's coming from restoration projects in Eastern Oregon. And um, it is, uh, we're turning it into all kinds of cool products from garden box material to decking and flooring and interior wall paneling, exterior siding. And so we saw a real need for utilizing the lumber that's coming out of this restoration work um, and turning it into something very productive and useful. Uh, it's a very long lasting uh, wood product and it's especially useful in garden projects because it has natural aromatic oils in the wood that help make it incredibly rot resistant and, and easy to use. It's rugged and durable and is a, a beautiful uh, wood product um, that has multiple uses. And the idea that we can, um, well, if I can get my screen to work, sorry about that, um, that we can um, help you build with purpose doing any number of um, awesome products. So if you've got a product, a project in, in the works that is going to utilize wood, give us a call and, uh, and we can help you uh, get what you need. One of the things that I love about what we do is that we are stewarding a, a community connected by good wood. And today I'm honored to um, introduce you to four different speakers that are going to talk about how they um, use Juniper in projects around their um, farms and in their work in nonprofit organizations um, and helping people learn how to grow their own food. Um, and um, I want to introduce you, first of all, to our first speaker, Mirabai Collins. Um, she's a co-founder of Black Futures Farm. And uh, Black Futures Farm is a project of the Black Food Sovereignty Coalition in Southeast Portland. And they have a, a little farm in the Learnings Garden, Learning Gardens Lab. And there are community farms staffed by volunteers and two resident farmers, Mirabai and her partner, Malcolm. And, um, and they really have a goal to, to heal the connection between black people and the land. And it's an amazing farm and they're growing all kinds of beautiful things. 
And I am going to let Mirabai um, get set up to share her screen and let her take it away. So I'm going to stop sharing mine and introduce, introduce you and you can take it over now. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Um, thanks everyone for being here. I, uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. It'll be fun to tell you about the farm. I need to figure out my slide thing. So give me a minute. Um, yeah, that was a great introduction. Malcolm and I have a farm. It's actually a community farm, so it's not our farm, but it's, um, we kind of, we do a lot of the work and we get a lot of help from the community and from Black Food Sovereignty Coalition. And um, we grow vegetables. We have a CSA, a small CSA. We go to markets. It's an evolving project. Um, if people come by and hang out um, and they want to take stuff home, that's fine. We donate to um, another one of Black Food Sovereignty Coalition's programs, Grandma's Hands. Um, sometimes we donate, sometimes they buy it, uh, which is an intergenerational cooking program for Black families. And we try to stay connected and responsive. So we don't have a set sort of way of being. We just kind of see what needs to get done. And if we can help do it, uh, that's what we that's what we do and we do it growing food and community so let me see i'm gonna figure this out just bear with me i did it wonderfully yesterday um so i have a set of slides to show you and I am going to share them right now. Okay, can you see, what do you see? My slide set, yeah? Okay, good. All right, so Black Futures Farm, that's us. A little bit of history. Um, we came out of a program, uh, a grant that was called Black Feast that Oregon Food Bank and Mudbone Grown um, came together to see what the black community or members of the black community wanted to spend this money on that they had gotten um, around food systems. So we had a few meetings, people showed up, we decided we wanted to build garden boxes um, in people's homes or for black people in the community. Uh, we did a few of those. Uh, the project kind of grew and some of us um, really got into it and stayed together. And we, after building four or five garden boxes, we kind of got together and decided what we wanted to do next, if we wanted to keep doing garden boxes or do something else. And we decided that we wanted to have a community space. Um, so we were kind of looking for places where that could be. We ended up on some habitat for humanity land. Um, we grew there and ate and played music and spent time together and it was really great. And then we had to go because they needed to build some housing on it. And Malcolm worked across the street from Black, where Black Futures Farm is now. And he spoke with some site partners, PSU, OSU, um, Parks and Rec, um, some people from OSU Extension. And then we had a few meetings and gained access to the space. So the whole, Mudbone, We Grow family kind of came together. We had some more meetings, what to do with the space and decided to um, have some production areas and then have a community area um, and just got going on it. Oops, I'm sorry. So that, so that's where we are now, Black Futures Farm. We have one primary goal, which is to heal the connection between black people and the land. So we just wanna be able to bring black people together around growing food and sharing and um, being in community. I can't, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do the slide thing in a way that's not weird. Oh, I got it, okay. So we do this uh, through kind of a more inclusive black center, um, indigenous and other people of color centered model of engagement and stewardship. So we make sure that we're always in communication with other members of the community. Um, we're always uh, listening to new ideas or what people need and um, trying, to, trying to incorporate it into what happens at Black Futures Farm. There's some of our corn and some other things, I don't know. 
Uh, we also really value cooperative work, collective governance, collective goals, shared responsibilities. We work together. Um, we share the bounty. There's no real ownership. Um, we're trying to really emphasize a model of sharing and community. And so we have a lot of volunteers. Lynn has been one of them. That's how we ended up with our um, Juniper compost, which I'll show you later. So we have a couple of um, on-site programs. The most important one for us right now is Black Sundays, where uh, the Black community comes together and we have Sunday on the farm and there's no one there but us and we just kind of do our thing. We try to incorporate experiential learning, um, just talk about what's growing and how it's growing and how to prepare it. Um, there's our CSA. We have a couple of interns that are kind of learning with us as we do the CSA. Um, and then we have a market intern who does some CSA stuff and some market stuff. So we're all kind of uh, just gaining experience by having these different projects on site. There's a little community space. And this is the beginning of our compost bin. So how this came about was Lynn came to volunteer, suggested some juniper stuff be uh, built on site. Uh, Malcolm, my partner, and I decided that a compost would be great. Portland Edible Gardens were also volunteering and everyone came together to make it happen. So that's the Portland Edible Gardens crew. That's the juniper. And this is the beautiful compost bin. It's super sturdy. Um, it's, they built it, it's pretty amazing. It has wire to keep the pests out. It's got three different chambers. The front boards are removable. The wood is beautiful. Uh, because the farm is still growing right now, it's kind of the coolest thing we have on site. Um, we did get a shed after this, but before we got the shed, the compost bin was definitely the best built structure. And there it is in all its glory. I think Malcolm kind of put this together. Um, there it is again. That's what the slats taken off. And I think it took maybe about a, a day. No, it took a few hours to build. Maybe a couple half days. Um, and there's a little close up. Malcolm really wanted me to get a close up of how well it was made. So, um, so yeah, we just started using it. We got it kind of at the end of the season. Um, it's getting full, but not entirely full. And um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. I'm pretty excited about it. That I think is my last slide. So that's our story. I'm gonna go back to a pretty picture for you guys there. Okay. That's beautiful. Love your place, Mirabai. I love what you guys are doing. And I, I love your the, the sharing and the sense of community that you're building. Really appreciate that good work. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot yeah. of fun, a lot yeah. of fun, a lot of work too. Yeah. <laughs> Antonio Rodriguez uh, is with Growing Gardens and has been for some time. Um, and he is an amazing uh, community leader and grew up in Mexico, has a lot of experience with gardening and he brings that to Growing Gardens. Um, Growing Gardens is a Portland-based nonprofit that uses the experience of growing food in schools, backyards, and correctional facilities to cultivate healthy and equitable communities. Thanks everyone. My name is uh, Antonio Rodriguez. I've been, actually I've been uh, with Growing Gardens since like 2014 as a participant. And, uh, but I've been in, I mean, it's incredible how much you, uh, you think you know everything, but once you start working with other communities, I mean, it's like, I know nothing. Um, I grew up in Mexico, uh, helping my father in, uh, in a farm, basically. And uh, he, we used to grow corn, uh, zuc zucchinis and uh, beans, but that's all we could grow. And because we were waiting just for the rain, you know, every year, it's just the rainy season. And sometimes we didn't get a lot of rain, so we didn't get, we weren't really successful. And uh, as I told you, I started as a participant in 2014, and then I started, uh, you know, spreading the word about uh, 
growing gardens and uh, home gardens program so that uh, I started telling other people, my neighbors, my friends about the program. And then I was offered as if I could become a community organizer. And uh, so, but I would like to say, why? I don't need to get paid. I, I can be a volunteer. So no, actually, we 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 started with you, so you're gonna be the first community organizer, and uh, it's okay. <laughs> I was the experiment, and uh, so now we have like seven community organizers, <laughs> and uh, so it's 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 really good now. I mean, because uh, I mean, and being a community organizer is one of the best jobs, I would say, because you have you get in contact with uh, families. And it's uh, one of the main part that uh, I like to work with growing gardens. Uh, I have three children. My, uh, I sorry, just uh, when we're going to say about my family too. Sorry, uh, my oldest daughter is Mercedes, and then Rebecca, and my youngest son is Antonio. And uh, I just want to share about my family and and what we do out here. You know, we have a, also a, our own backyard where we grow just a few things, uh, mainly what we like. And one of the things that I like the most, my wife and I, we like hot, hot peppers. So one of the we, ones we grow are like Carolina Reapers. So those are really good, really good taste. And so we enjoy them. So, so uh, as I told you, you know, Growing Garden started uh, 2000, actually this year is the 25th anniversary of Growing Gardens. We started in 1996 and our mission, you know, Growing Gardens uses the experience of growing food in schools, backyards and correctional facilities to cultivate healthy and equitable communities. So we have three main programs. One is uh, youth growth, let us grow, and the one that I work home gardens so and we really practice as an organization we really practice anti-racism so all the organization including the board they we have to go through a three-day uh, training so a, a, a workshop that we will have to go through that and plus we've been having uh, also book clubs about uh, how to be anti-racism so it's one of the things that I enjoy the most too. I mean, I mean, there's so many things it's hard to say which one you love the most because you you know, when you work with the community, it's, uh, it's amazing. So, uh, this is one of the, I'm just going to talk briefly about our programs because this, I mean, each program do a lot. So I'm just going to go just a little bit. So as you know, uh, when once the pandemic started, everything has been um, virtual, they've been having virtual classes and creating all these amazing uh, ways to keep working with the community. Uh, and this program actually has been getting all these uh, kids, all the explorer kids for all children. And, and sometimes I've been watching uh, the youth growth uh, workers or co workers that they're, they're actually doing these classes virtually and they're at the office and I keep hearing all this excitement uh, from children, you know, when they're in a, getting all these workshops. I mean, that, you know, uh, this tell us that nothing can stop stop us uh, teaching. And, uh, and, you know, it's when I see those things, actually I get more excited and, and, and low my job more actually than because it's one that one of the things that uh, I get like feel. I mean, it's like seeing all these children really excited, even starting from just uh, garden kids or even cooking uh, classes that they've been given. Even the other day, I saw one uh, one of the educators was saying about tortillas and how to make the mass and how to do prepare all these things. And I, I could hear all these children how, I mean, their excitement that they were learning something new and I, I never expect to see these amazing things from our own programs right there, you know, like, and since we are, are really busy, we don't see exactly what we 
or to you know the program but i mean once they start seeing it yeah, you gotta get more involved with this program <laughs> but amazing thing that we do and uh, so we also also have the uh, other uh, program that is uh, lettuce growth and uh, so i uh, i mean i haven't gotten that much uh, with them because what they do is uh, uh, I mean, I can really express what that, I mean, when I, I see the amazing things they do in the correctional facilities, because uh, the other day when I, I was seeing in, is that how much they produce in, in the facilities and in all the participation that they have from the inmates too, and not only adults, too, also uh, youth, uh, that uh, juvenile, I mean, prisons that they're in Oregon. And, and uh, so do we have the next slide, Lynn? So I, I was going to show you that, you know, uh, there's uh, RIMA that, uh, and there's not, not only RIMA in uh, Miravai, that they do a really amazing job that I, I really, I'm, 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 that they really encouraged me to keep working with the community. So, cause uh, I was seeing how much they produce and how much they used to share uh, with the food pantries. So, and one of the things that really amaze, I mean, I'm, I, like I said, a little thing amazed me so much that uh, the 4% recidivism, that is like, I mean, it's, is amazing compared to the 30% of in Oregon or in 70% of nationally that the, the people who are in the, our program, I consider my program, even though I don't work straight with Mirai and, and Rima, but but the amazing job they do, I mean, it's, I mean, it's incredible what they've been achieved by, uh, I mean, learn, I mean, by teaching all the or culture uh, classes that have been given to prisoners, and uh, and not only that, they you know they've been even healthier, and uh, and plus they once they get out of the prison, they get all this, they get a certificate, and they you know they feel more, so that actually uh, helps them to to work with self esteem. So I mean it's like increases their self esteem. And here's the last program is where I work is mainly that I work with the families. So the families get uh, free for three years, they get plans, they get um, advisor, they get uh, seeds, they get uh, tools. And one of the things that we offer right now, actually in, uh, in April or in spring is that we offer three kinds of uh, types of uh, ways that they can learn. So if the families have uh, space on the backyard, we can, uh, we do the in-ground. And if for some reason they have, they, they can, they have problems. We also offer a raised bed. That's uh, actually a longer list. Actually, it's on a, we have a longer list on those. And if for some reason they can, they don't have any of those spaces available, if, if they'll, they learn more, allows them to have containers, we offer containers. And also we work with the uh, community gardens that if, you know, there's somebody who would like to have a community garden, we get getting connected with, uh, with them too. And we get amazing stories from our participants. You know, they eat more fruits and vegetables. They, they, can, they play with children and then children learn how to grow their vegetables and learn how to eat them. And uh, I mean, you, get to hear all these incredible stories. I mean, it'll be a whole list here that we endless list that we get from participants that they, how much they enjoy and, uh, and the change they've made from, uh, and the taste is different than what they get from stores is you can't really compare the taste that you get from this, I mean, growing your own organic vegetables and at home. I mean, it's like 
amazing. You can see some of those pictures that uh, we took, you know, with children enjoying what they have at home. And uh, I mean, it's like I say, I can't really express my emotions when I see all this. And, and when you are there with the community. Um, so we have uh, built, when I, uh, we have built some of the raised beds using Juniper. And I, I didn't know about Juniper until 2019 when we built uh, some raised bed at our, uh, with our uh, partners that actually community partners that I was like, I, I was asking there were a lot of questions because uh, it was really, I, I, I ended up picking all the wood that, and, uh, and I was like, why I didn't know about this wood? This is like amazing. It was really heavy and sturdy and like, I said, oh yeah, that, that lasts like 65 years. And uh, so, wow, why, why cannot we offer this to our uh, participants? Well, then it's well, of course it's really expensive, but you know, but it lasts for forever. As you can tell down below on the right, I mean, we use fur and it doesn't last that long. It's like six to seven years probably. So we is, you know, we got a call from participants. So oh, can you guys come and rebuild my bed? And like, when I came over, I said, oh yeah, we can. So I hope in the future we can, you know, of course, nonprofit, you know, run with grants and, uh, and donate donations. So I hope one time we can, uh, you know, we can afford to get some juniper so that we can uh, make all these nice beds for our participants. Uh, also, um, there's a lot of ways to get involved with our organizations uh, with money, tools, uh, supplies, good, good, of course. So, and, uh, so one of the ways to volunteer right now, we're not doing that as you can see in one of those pictures, but we, when we used to do the bills. So every Saturday and during April or in the, during the fall, we get together and get up with the volunteers. And then from there, we go to people's homes to start building gardens and in-ground raised beds or, you know. And also there's a lot of ways that you can uh, become a volunteer, there's the endless. <laughs> ways that you can uh, do that also uh you know we have the plant distribution we got you know the plant growers uh, you can participate when we have all these events like uh, like i mentioned plant distribution uh soaring seeds uh there's a lot to do and and i'm sure if when you come you'll you'll see what i'm telling that how much fun you're gonna have and last year because the pandemic, we started also we started also virtual consultations that that's been working really good. We've been having even people from around the world, around this country, that calling about you know, uh, uh, so they want to to know how to garden. So we also have every year we offer uh, we have chef in the garden, so that I mean this is also like one of the fanciest uh, dishes so you can have or well, right now with the pandemic but when you come to these events i mean it's like amazing with all these cooks amazing dis dishes that you can uh, and you some i mean you can eat a lot or get a taste from uh, around the world too so thank you for my first uh, my thank you for being here and uh so I guess we're gonna save questions last. So thank you again. Oh, thank you, Antonio. Thank you so much. Yeah, Growing Gardens is an amazing organization. And I met Antonio when you first came on board, when I first came on board here um, at Sustainable Northwest Wood. And it's been a pleasure working with you guys over the years. I wanna, um, my brother also grows those Carolina Reapers and they're an amazing hot pepper. They are hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Couple yeah. things I want to um, just clarify. Um, juniper is more expensive than fur, but lasts three or four times as long. And it's about half the cost of cedar. So when you're considering building a garden box, um, it, it sits in the middle as far as cost goes, but it's longer lasting than any other wood product that we have. And um, and it, you know, like you said, it's rugged and durable and it's very long lasting. So it makes for really nice 
uh, material to do, to do garden boxes, especially if you're uh, looking to do something um, organic that doesn't have any added chemicals and, and will be very long lasting. And I want to introduce um, our next speaker, and this is Bo Lemieux uh, with Portland Edible Gardens. He's one of the project managers for Portland Edible Gardens, and they were not able to be with us in person today. So I had the opportunity to go visit with Bo um, at a job site in Hillsboro and talk to him a little bit about the work they do. Portland Edible Gardens is a company here um, that's, that strives to help making uh, growing your own food easy and fun and productive. And they offer consulting and design and installation and garden membership. So they will come out to your home and build your garden box for you. They'll help you come up with a detailed plan on, on, on exactly what to grow based on what you um, want to enjoy at your dinner table. And so if you don't have the tools or the skills to build your own garden box, these guys will do it for you. Um, and they're a really um, very cool organization. And I, the recording we did um, at a safe distance because it is a pandemic. So um, the volume is just a little bit light. So if you wanna turn up your volume just a little bit, um, that might be conducive to, to hearing what right. Bo has to say. My name is Bo, I'm Here with Portland is. Edible Gardens. And at Portland Edible Gardens, we help people grow their own food um, at their own homes. And we do so by building uh, custom raised garden beds to fit the space and the need of the customer. Um, on the other side of things, we also offer consulting and we come up with customizable or customized uh, planting plans to help people grow what they want to grow and what they want to eat ultimately. Uh, I just want to emphasize sun, soil, and water. Um, choosing a location that has consistent sun, really important. Uh, one of the other benefits of a raised garden bed is that you get to choose the soil. You're not stuck with what you have at your home, which might be hard packed clay, something like that. Um, so the raised garden bed really, really makes it easier to, to grow what you wanna grow. Um, and then importantly, you have to have a consistent water source. Um, cedar and juniper are good. We like juniper more. Um, Why do you like juniper more? What, what are some of the advantages that you see it's cost effective, um, it's solid, long lasting, um, and then I think just personal preference, um, I like the, the liveliness and the, the personality of the wood. It smells great to work with, which is, <laughs> counts for something. Um, yeah, I think it's it's solid and um, it, it feels like a part of the landscape. I think it feels a bit more a bit more like a, a hardscape or almost like a, a living hardscape instead of just like a, a very clean um, processed cedar bed. It's, it's also fun, you know, you have to work with it and every piece is different. So you have to kind of, I don't know, wrestle it a little bit. Um, yeah, so we, we like working with Jennifer. Yeah. What do you like about the work you do? I like working outside. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful day and um, being new to Portland as well, it's fun to get to know different parts of the city and the state. Um, I like working with a purpose, um, helping people grow their own food and um, I guess sort of transforming what used to be a lawn um, into something productive and good for the, the homeowners and um, just for, I think it, it, it promotes a, a different way of living too, you know, like even in 
Hillsboro, um, you can still grow your own food and, and have a little bit of that self-sufficiency. And, um, and I really appreciate that. The work itself as well um, is really satisfying. It's a, it's a good combination of, of physical work um, and problem solving and um, there's just something satisfying about making something with quality, um, something that is, is done right and you know it's going to last and um, I, I really enjoy that. So there are lots of ways to make garden boxes and um, Portland Edible in this particular uh, video use some two by six in eight and 10 foot lengths um, and builds the, the frame screwed together with outdoor screws. And then they use uh, Simpson strong ties uh, in between the planks to kind of help hold everything in place. Uh, we also sell some four by fours uh, that can be used as the corner posts and there's different dimensions, different sizes and lots of different ways that you can put together a, a garden box and I will be sharing um, some more detail about some different ways that that you can um, build garden boxes and these guys do a beautiful job you can you can create them um, as tall as you want to work in the space and build them to fit the space that you have available. Lots of different design ideas. You can um, create a little ledge that you can sit on. I know with growing gardens, you guys are really um, focused on accessibility. And so that's one thing to consider too, with just the overall height and how much stooping and bending. It can be something as simple as a one by six uh, screwed together for, to grow some lettuce. So uh, a little bit needs to be considered in the way of what you want to grow and what kind of room it needs, what kind of uh, root depth it needs. And so a lot of considerations there in order to come up with a plan. And, and we can totally help you with that. If you uh, give us a call or a stop by our shop, um, we can give you all kinds of pointers and ideas to get you started in the right direction. Or you can reach out to Portland Edible Gardens, have them build one for you, um, or reach out to Growing Gardens and see if you can get in their home gardening plan. Or you can talk to our next guest, Lydia Cox with Radish Gardens, who also offers a lot of um, coaching for gardens and landscape design to help you come up with the right plan for your space and to help you enjoy a beautiful, productive landscape that feeds your family and benefits the environment. And uh, Lydia is uh, one of my favorite people and I'm really excited to see what she has to share. There's some beautiful um, opportunities and before and afters that she's gonna share with her work. And I'm gonna stop my screen share and Lydia, you can hop on there and share yours. All right, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here, especially with so many wonderful organizations. Um, I am going to just give a, another brief introduction on who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, so my name is Lydia Cox. My business is Radish Gardens. Um, this is me. I love plants. I love hanging out outside. Um, I grow a lot of food and flowers at home. Um, we actually recently moved, so I'm kind of starting over from scratch. Um, and so that's been quite an experience to not just kind of hit the ground running, um, but it's been really wonderful to be able to kind of develop a new garden. Um, but in past years, grow a lot of um, food to share with neighbors and to enjoy ourselves. 
Um, we've got chickens, urban chickens. Um, it's been quite the adventure at our new place because they spend part of their time out front and a lot of the neighbors, it's not something they're used to. So that's been a really um, fun adventure with the chickens. Um, and of course our cat who likes to supervise all of our projects that we do. Um, my wife and I, we love to spend time outside. Um, she's primarily the one that has built most of the, the raised bed and other elements in our old garden. Um, and we love to travel. So just a little background about me. And I will say a little tip if you also enjoy traveling, when we get back to a point when we can do that, um, a lot of places have botanical gardens. It's a wonderful way, a way to see what plants are um, really uh, prominent and native to different areas. So yeah, so my business, Radish Gardens, um, what I do is I really help, uh, strive to help folks grow food at home and also create habitat for pollinators, beneficial insects, birds, other um, urban wildlife. I primarily work in urban and um, suburban uh, homes. And so my background, uh, my uh, undergrad degree is actually in interior design. And I really appreciated being able to learn about design as problem solving. Um, but I wasn't, by the time I got through the program, I wasn't really crazy about the amount of waste um, that can often happen in interior design. A lot of materials are kind of pulled out when they have a lot of life left. I know there's some great improvements with more sustainable design. But I decided to kind of pivot after graduating and um, actually went to work uh, in nonprofit work for almost 10 years. And that was wonderful. I did a year of AmeriCorps service. It connected me with some amazing organizations. Shout out to Hands on Greater Portland. Um, and so I was able to connect with a lot of different nonprofits that focus on sort of those bigger picture systems changes. So folks who are um, working to restore pieces of land that are degraded, um, organizations like Growing Gardens who are working on really uh, making sure that healthy organic food is accessible. Um, and that was really wonderful. And so as I was wrapping up my time working with a few different nonprofits, I transitioned into um, getting a degree in environmental landscape management. And I wanted to be able to focus on, um, you know, the systems change is vital. That's what we really need. But there are a lot of individual choices that people are making, especially in urban and suburban environments that are um, not benefiting the, the environment, are not productive or creating a yield or a harvest for them or any of the other critters around. So I wanted to be able to have an impact there. And so, you know, one goal I have is that the impact that um, folks make is at worst not doing harm and at best supporting ecosystems, producing food, producing a harvest that they and their community can appreciate. Um, so really my vision when I work with clients is to connect them with food systems and with nature, get them outside um, into spaces that they can really feel um, a connection with. Um, creating and sustaining healthy soil. Soil is so important and most of us think that we're starting with soil that we can't do anything with and that's not true. You just have to know what inputs to do, how to kind of manage that into a, a nice fertile space that you can grow food in. Um, and then really just connecting folks with spaces that can be rejuvenating. So that's kind of why I do what I do. Um, these are the things that I offer. Um, so consultations are big. Um, I work with a lot of folks who are kind of more DIY mindset, but they, they maybe just don't know if the ideas they have are going to work. Um, they don't know what they don't know. So I do a lot of site assessment support, helping make sure that folks are, are putting things in the right amount of sun, are thinking about the different seasons in their landscape and how to maximize what they're growing. Um, same with garden planning. So for folks who have in ground or raised beds. Um, I think it's similar to what edible, uh, PDX Edible Gardens does where really giving you that sort of map so that as you grow your confidence and your, your knowledge as a gardener, you have somewhere to start. Um, I do coaching on edible gardening and also on organic landscape maintenance. Um, there's a lot of um, waste and there's a lot of um, sort of blind spots where people are over managing plants or not focusing on caring for soil and then just trying to manage the problems that might come from that. Um, so working with folks who really want to have a hand in how the plants and their landscape are managed, um, I can do, um, I can give them some of that knowledge so they feel confident and that they're doing what needs to be done but no more. 
usually I'm telling people to do less than they've been doing, which is usually very well received. Um, and then of course design work, and I'm also rolling out this year garden classes. I um, really wanna be able to get out information to as many folks as possible. Um, I, for the last three years, have also been a presenter with the East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. And so they have a, an absolutely free two and a half hour workshop um, all about creating an edible landscape. Um, we've got a few more, I think we've got two or three more sessions in the next two to three months. Um, so definitely something to check out. You can find it on my website or on their website. Um, so really just trying to get that information out to folks. So I wanted to give a couple of examples of some different um, sort of design work um, and client support that I've done related to um, creating gardens at home and making the most of your space. So this is a client, this is one of my first clients, and they had this space that was just really not used, um, wasn't super pretty to look at. They, they just wanted to make it something productive, um, a space that they could actually and would want to spend time. And so what we did um, is we went ahead and we put in raised beds and we also created this sort of mixed um, hedge that is a mix of edible and uh, pollinator friendly plants. And so this was great. It just completely um, transformed the space, gave them space to make some really productive um, gardening and veggie beds for them to use throughout the year. Um, these are a couple examples of uh, plants that were in that hedge. We put in fig, we put in um, pineapple guava, things like that, that they could over time harvest from. And it would also give them a nice diverse um, sort of a little bit of privacy along the fence, um, but something that they and the wildlife could enjoy. Um, let's see. And then this next one, um, just got a couple more examples. This is what I see a lot. I work with a lot of folks where they're kind of starting with a pretty, what seems like a pretty rough base. Um, they've, you know, this was a newer construction home. So there was a lot of gravel and weeds and just not really a, a ideal soil to start with. Um, this was interesting because they actually had a landscape design already that one of their mothers had put together for them. And so they wanted to be able to keep the essence of that. They wanted to make a few changes so that they could increase how many of the plants were actually edible or produced, um, you know, a, a wider range of pollinator and wildlife services. And so we first focused on soil, building that soil, getting rid of any of the, the problematic, um, you know, the lawn and the weeds, um, really just getting the base work done. That's so, so important. Um, they already had a raised bed and this is one of, these are actually dear friends of mine who are also clients. And um, I really want to replace the bed with juniper because it's falling apart and they had it before. So we wanted to keep it until it doesn't work anymore, but that probably won't be much longer. Um, but so we wanted to make sure that they had this sort of baseline and access to everything. And then you can see you know, this is their landscape about a year, I think, after it was installed. And it still looks like a pretty traditional um, landscape um, in the sense that there are a lot of non-edible plants. Um, but we went ahead and we subbed out one of the trees for a persimmon tree. We subbed out some of the um, shrubs for blueberries. We made sure that their um, bed was in the sunniest part of this area. So we also um, exchanged some ground covers for time and oregano. So even just little changes here and there um, really helped them connect with the food producing ability in the space that they have. So this is their front yard now. Love it. Totally different from what it was before. And they got to keep sort of the, the main essence of the design that um, her mom did. And then just this last one is more of a habitat focus. This is um, a property where they, you know, again, they kind of said, I have no idea what I'm going to do. We've, we've got these little strips along the fence and we'd love to do something that helps wildlife. It's pretty shady. Um, and so we wanted to go ahead and create more of a wildlife corridor along this fence line. And so 
Um, this really worked well because they also happened to have a lot of downed wood that they were in the process of trying to get rid of. And, we, you know, it was easy to just say, no, 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 let's incorporate that. That's a great habitat. So really trying to also look at what resources they had on site and how it could be really easy to manage moving forward. So using something like a chipped wood, um, you know, chip drop, something like that for the ground level that will simultaneously build soil and be um, pretty inexpensive or possibly even free to top off in the years to come. So really simple changes like this can have a big impact. Um, so just want to wrap up um, by kind of focusing back on Juniper. Um, I love it. I think it's gorgeous. Lynn knows every time I reach out, I'm just like, oh my gosh, look at this Juniper and, and what we've been able to do with it. I just think it's a beautiful wood. Um, I appreciate that it has a story. I'm, I'm always telling folks about, um, you know, where it's coming from and how it's part of restoration work. Um, these are some beds and a little landing that we just put in this year. So they're kind of in the process of getting filled and, um, and planted out. Um, but I know they're going to last forever. They're in a very prominent, this is a front yard garden. So it's really nice because folks um, pass by and they get curious. So I think having something that I know is going to last a long time and look good and um, just be really, really sturdy for what we need it for. Um, it's just so, so nice. Um, and so these are just a couple of examples. And I will say one thing, I don't have a photo of, of this, but um, if you ever do any trellises or um, need posts or anything, the juniper looks really wonderful for that too. We have that at our old place as part of the deck. Um, so lots of uses. And then these are just a couple tips I wanted to end on um, for folks who are either new to gardening or are trying to kind of develop their sense or their confidence in gardening. Um, it's really so much about being curious, um, focusing on the ecosystem, that's what I'm, I'm constantly helping folks do is kind of stand back and look at the bigger picture. Um, I think it relates a lot to having realistic expectations in the garden. Um, for example, having pests show up on your broccoli and your kale is not failure. They're going to show up. That's that's nature. That's what's going to happen. Um, what is successful is figuring out, OK, can you take the time to understand what role they play? how they feed beneficial insects and birds, um, how you can manage them in, on your food um, producing plants in a way that you're doing the least amount of harm. So there are ways to, to be successful that don't mean that you just have unrealistic expectations that can't be met. Um, focusing on the soil is so, so important. And of course, connecting with other gardeners and especially folks who have been stewarding the land for millennia so really focusing on what knowledge is out there, what is specific to our region, and how we can share that knowledge is really important. And that's it, keeping it short and short and sweet. And thank you so much for your time and attention. That was amazing, Lydia. Thank you so much. You're such an inspiration. And uh, yeah, I definitely need to sign up for a consultation. I have all kinds of before and after opportunities for you. Uh, <laughs> and I, I really, I want to thank all of our speakers today. Um, I know there's probably some questions um, that have come up um, along the way. I want to do this real, share my screen again, just to get to this point. I want to offer up, um, if you have questions. If you're interested in Juniper for garden boxes, reach out to us, shoot us an email info at snwwood.com. You can also go to the homepage of our website and sign up for our newsletter. We put on a sustainable wood story like this uh, every couple of months and we do a deep dive into issues um, in our region um, about wood products in general. Um, and so that we can tell stories like this and bring experts uh, on a panel to uh, provide information and guidance. And, and my ultimate goal with this today is to, to connect you to these people on the panel. Uh, there's a, a lot of ways you can get involved either with growing your own food or with supporting organizations that do that for our community. And I really strongly encourage you to, um, to, to connect with each one of these uh, amazing folks today. And, and I would love to open up the floor to questions if there's specific things that you'd like to know from anybody on the panel or from us here at Sustainable Northwest Wood. 
Um, and, and do want to let you know that we're recording this today and I'll send a link around um, so that you'll have access um, for especially for those that might have registered but missed uh, the opportunity to be with us live. So um, and with that, I will um, offer up questions if there are some. Terry, if you want to chime in, if there's some specific ones that came through the chat, that would be awesome. Or you can unmute yourself um, and, and our participants and uh, give me a hand raise and we can answer some vital questions that you might have. What do you cook with Carolina Reapers? Antonio. <laughs> uh, what, what I do is that you can add that to anything. Actually, salsas are the main, the, the way we use uh, those peppers just to make salsas with tomatillos, tomatoes. I mean, you can. I've made a lot of your salsa, Antonio. Yeah, just mainly salsas. <laughs> Yeah, my brother makes hot sauce um, out of some of his, and it's just amazing. Put it on everything. Oh, yeah, let's see about the chat. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the last uh, in the last slide, Lydia showed a little picture of her deck out in front of her new um, office that she's built this this year. Uh, and juniper is an amazing material for decking. Um, and it's incredibly rot resistant, has a, a lot of personality and character, but it's very long lasting and really beautiful. And we can totally get you some more information about that if you want to give us a call or, or shoot us an email and get you some pricing and talk to you a little bit more about all the benefits of using it as a decking material. Stephanie had a question about using juniper for a retaining wall. Oh yeah, retaining walls is a really popular use for juniper. Um, we have this material available in a four by four, a five by five, a six by six, and even an eight by eight. Um, and so it's really sturdy, durable, and very rot resistant. So um, it, it's a key um, ingredient for a great retaining wall for sure. What else have we got? Uh, could I ask a question, please? Yeah. Sure. Um, just wanted to say thank you first. First off, I'm new to the area. I've designed gardens. Um, I come from Seattle. We use juniper a lot in our designs and our garden bed design and also the yeah retention walls, small walls with the six by sixes. Um, and so I guess I'm uh, first of all very excited that there's more juniper to offer in the city and was curious if there's a cut list or a price list that I could have with it if I should email for that. Yep, you sure can. You can email for that. And I would encourage you, especially as a designer, um, to sign up for our newsletter. It comes out once a month and it has an updated price list every month. Okay. Um, and it's also a way to stay connected with us when we host events like this. You'll be the first one to get news like that and all kinds of cool things that that we are involved in uh, throughout the year, as well as you know project profiles and would love if anybody has used Juniper to email us with your photos as well, because um, we love to share those with, with people for inspiration. So all of those things, info at snwwood.com will get you, um, just um, shoot us an email and we can get your price list. Okay, yeah, thanks for the great work everybody's oh, doing, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Patrick, thanks for the question and thanks for your support too, glad you're here. Yeah, juniper is gorgeous, and it does have so much character and uh, like a lot of a lot of personality, and and it's just a really fun product to work with. I tell people every day that it's it's very varied from piece to piece because it's not grown for its lumber; it's a restoration product, and so it it has multiple uh, positive impacts, and and that's a, a really cool thing from restoring the grassland in eastern Oregon to providing jobs for people in rural communities in that part of our state. Um, and then jobs are created all along the way from the sawmills to the fabricators who um, turn that raw wood into decking for us and, um, and a, just a lot of different products along the way. So positive impact for the environment, positive impact for our economy, and then also a really gorgeous, long lasting thing that you can show off to your friends. So um, multiple benefits for this amazing wood. 
And I'm so glad you guys have all been here. Um, probably have time for like maybe one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and just want to thank you all for being here and thanks for your support and uh, check out our friends here to uh, provide some support to them as well. All right, if that's the last one, I just want to say thank you. I'm glad you're here and we'll look forward to seeing you at our wood yard sometime here in the near future. And happy gardening, everybody. <laughs>